Hello everyone. Um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome for this session. And uh, today's topic is introduction to integration CSIT. And uh, uh, myself, Sumesh and Sindhuri, all of my colleagues will be presenting. Um, so you know, before starting coming to the topic, um, I would like to tell you that it won't be an exaggeration to say we are living in a startup age and uh, where you know a bright idea takes a shape, few people come together and then um, you know we see funds that idea and then they start something new. And for a startup to grow into a big corporation to a successful business, it is very important that uh, we should know how soon the startup should fail. That we call it, you know, uh, fast fail mode actually. The sooner the startup fails, uh, it is better because if you know beforehand whether it fails or the idea is going to succeed and it will have, it will have viability, it will have economic sense. So if I could extend the same analogy to our open source community, the major important thing here is since uh, you know, yesterday Phil said some you know, 80 uh, plus projects is going on. And uh, it is very imperative to know whether the projects that is you know, fast evolving at a very high speed, you know, maybe you know, a release in a six month. So it is very important to know whether the things that is going in, the code that are being checked in, whether those are performing well or not in a daily basis. So there comes the integration testing. And uh, so I will uh, start uh, with a quote from Bill Gates. The first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. If, if the, uh, you know, uh, the design is good, and uh, the code is good, then definitely the automation will run and it will magnify the efficiency. And uh, the second is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. So, so this is very important actually. And more often we stumble upon the second part and that's where the, you know, fell fast, uh, that analogy comes into picture. So in that sense, the uh, CSIT plays a very important role and um, if I say it is the backbone of the whole ODL open source community, it won't be an exaggeration. So going into agenda, so basically uh, the topic and uh, all the steps, the structures, the, those are designed for any person who is uh, mostly if he is from, uh, from test background, having little bit of automation knowledge, then also he will be able to, after going through this session, he will able to understand, he will able to at least do and has the capability to contribute to the uh, open source community. So the course is designed in that manner or the uh, topic and the, uh, the structure of the session is designed in that way. So smaller things which are maybe very you know, common for a developer like you know, uh, JIT commands and other things, uh, which are not, a tester might not be familiar, so we have incorporated those things also. So, so coming to today's agenda, we'll first, uh, you know, in the introduction to integration test, um, we'll discuss the uh, CI infrastructure, that is the continuous integration infrastructure, then we will discuss on introduction to key terminologies. So basically, you know, um, within the you know, continuous system integration test, uh, you know, in that ecosystem, there are, of, there are a lot of other things, there are a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, utilities or systems, those are used uh, to make it as a full-fledged running system. And uh, so one important thing is a robot framework where, based on which all the automation test suits runs, then another is Git, Basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a you know, version control system. And then uh, Garrett, it is a code collaboration tool. So we will, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, touch upon those concepts so that, uh, you know, 
uh, when we integrate everything, it will be easier to understand for everybody. And then Jenkins, that is the most important because that is, the Jenkins is the place where the continuous integration test will run. So then we will see what are the prerequisites. Basically, we'll see what are the prerequisites in terms of software, like what are the basic minimum softwares are required so that we can come up with a, you know, at least a three node, uh, you know, SDN controller, and then uh, we can uh, run our automation test in that. Then uh, we have chosen uh, a you know, very simple and basic topology. And uh, then uh, we will look upon the controller installation, like uh, how if you just clone it, uh, a basic distribution zip, how you can uh, run a controller in a, you know, in a cluster environment. So that we will uh, show, and then getting started. Then we will look upon the CSET directory structures, like once you clone this is integration test, so how the directory structures looks like, and then how you can navigate through that. So what are the important directories, and uh, you know uh, where, uh, which performs which role, that we will explain. And uh, the important CSET libraries, that is very important, because uh, uh, all the projects, like you know, be it uh, controller project, be it uh, OpenFlow plugin, be it OpenFlow Java, uh, be it uh, you know VPN services, all the projects uh, they will keep their libraries in one part that is uh, you know, that is in uh, integration CSET libraries. So we'll touch upon that also. And then the important CSET variables. If you want to run, uh, as I said from the start, that uh, after going through this session, you should be able to if you follow it step by step, it should act as a guide so that you can run something. Uh, so. What are the important CSET variables that you should know? These are the very basic variables. And if you know that, then it will be easier for you to you know, run your uh, uh, test run. And in the second part, we'll see how to start a test run and knowing dependencies. So in that, the important robot framework libraries. So uh, here I would like to say, if you want to uh, you know, work or contribute in the integration CSET, you need not to be a you know, very good in uh, Python or Perl or anything. If you have any knowledge of any scripting language or any very basic you know, development background, then you should be able to work on that. So in that, for that reason, so we have included this. So we'll touch upon the very, because all the automation things runs in the robot framework. So we'll touch upon the basic libraries that, uh, that are being used and so that uh, you, know, you can browse through that and uh, maybe you know, uh, extend it to further um, uh, writing the test code or also committing it to the community. Then basic writing of a test suit, um, how you can uh, write a test suit, what are the, the way it is structured, uh, th there is a you know, kind of uh, ways of working is there, uh, or coding guidelines are there, so that we will touch upon basic writing of a test suit. Then script runtime argument, if you are running, uh, either you can run it in manually or you can run it via a write tool. So what are the basic arguments that are required? So we will explain that. Then test coding and submission guidelines. So briefly we will touch upon all those things. And then sample run of clustering test suits. So this maybe we know will not be able to do it, uh, but uh, you know I will touch upon while you know going through this slide actually how to uh, run a you know upstream script in sandbox. There I will you know show you at least give a feel that how a clustering test suite is run, and then how to upstream your script. That is very important actually. You anyone can write anything, but uh, unless until it is upstreamed, unless until it, it is running in uh, the CSET environment, it doesn't have any value. So and uh, here is a I would say stringent guidelines are there. You cannot upstream just like that. It has to go through a review cycle. And uh, it, uh, so th that also we will see actually how, uh, how easy it is uh, you know, to upstream and uh, you know, how that process goes through. So we'll uh, do that. So in that, uh, we need to know, as I said, right, uh, those who are from you know, uh, test background and don't do in day-to-day -day, uh, their uses, don't use git commands. So we will run upon the basic git commands that those are used for uh, pushing a script and raising a Garrett review. And then how to cherry pick and push and amend and patch. And that is the whole uh, scripting part. And then how to run a script in sandbox. That is also equally important. So when you put a script for review, 
So the first thing they will ask is that, uh, you know, give a sandbox run. So uh, this is very important. So to make a sandbox, there is an elaborate procedure. So we have captured all those steps there one by one. So that we will uh, go. So there we'll see what is sandbox and how you can configure a sandbox, how you can uh, create a sandbox instance, how you can run there, all those things we'll uh, discuss. And then how to run up, uh, how to run upstream scripts in sandbox. So that also will uh, touch upon. And then question and answer session. So it's a packed agenda, and uh, I would like to uh, call my colleague Sumesh uh, to explain the uh, CI infrastructure part. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, I'll take you to the continuous integration infrastructure. So the, uh, this uh, diagram has been taken from the ODL community page. So I'll, my focus of area would be on the system test here. So it's a common, uh, this thing, all the developer would be using this environment. So what happens initially, the uh, contributor will uh, source the code using JIT. So all these tools, JIT or Jenkins, will be explained in the consecutive slides. I'll just overview the process here, and I'll just move on to the system test. And I'll ex explain you about the system test procedure, which is our uh, uh, this thing here. So, uh, so when a contributor uh, pulls the code using JIT, so uh, and he builds the code, all the necessary RT graphs are developed, dev downloaded from the Nexus repository, and he does a code change and he pushes back to the Jenkins server. So Jenkins server will uh, do a uh, verified job. So it will tr uh, trigger a verified job where it will do a build check whether the uh, all the uh, continuous integration tests have passed. So once the continuous integration tests have passed, uh, the patch is sent for the uh, review. So the, uh, the reviewer will uh, uh, approve the review comments, and it will be sent to the committer who will commit those changes into an, into an particular project. So once, once it is done, the, the merge job is triggered. The Jenkins will again trigger a merge job here, where it will run again the continuous integration test once all the continuous integration tests are done, it will, it's successful, the build is successful, then it will uh, uh, upload the necessary RT graphs to the Nexus repository. So once it is done, so uh, there comes the system test. So for, to run a system test, you need a distribution image and an automation framework that will deploy the uh, uh, controller and it will run the test for those network tools, whatever you have committed. So I'll move on to the next slide here. So, so as stated in my previous test, oh, so in system test we use Robo framework. So, uh, so why Robo framework? So this is the next slide. Why we are using Robo framework? So re Robo uh, framework is an open source and generic, uh, and generic uh, tool uh, which is widely used for acceptance testing and te and uh, data driven test acceptance. And uh, Robo Framework is an uh, uh, Robo Framework is an uh, uh, this thing uh, operating system independent. Uh, uh, it's an operating system independent. You can run on Windows or Linux. So the core of uh, Robo Framework is implemented in Python. Uh, you can run it on. It even runs on JPython. So it integrates well with the Jenkins server. So that is what I have shown in the common in, uh, uh, continuous integration slide. Whenever and developer push the code, the continuous integration test runs on the build. So it's, it's very easy to track and uh, uh, very easy to start the test and track the results. Then it, uh, the, uh, the Robo framework has a good uh, report and lo logging capabilities, which can be uh, looked whenever a test fails. It's easy to view those in an HTML format, which will tell you about the results and what is the error, what was the expected, and what, is, what was the error condition there. And it can be used against variety of interfaces. You can use against REST, or you can use against an UI. So it integrates. It uh, integ uh, Robo framework integrates with a continuous delivery pipeline uh, with a test code repository. So this is why uh, we need a Robo framework in the system test environment. So these are the tools I explained as explained in the continuous infrastructure uh, slide. So what is JIT? JIT is nothing but it's a version control system. It's mostly used for used by software development. 
and it's a distributed ver uh, version, uh, version control system with emphasis on system data integrity. And uh, so every JIT working directory is a full-fledged repository, which has the complete history of a full tracking capabilities and independent of network access or a central server. So what is Gerit? Gerit is nothing but a uh, uh, web-based team, mostly used by the software de uh, de uh, development team. Again, it's a code collaboration tool. It can be used uh, by the software uh, team or uh, software team to review each other review comments. And it's a uh, web browser, so you can see the differences. You can approve or reject those changes. So what is Jenkins? Again, as explained in the continuous infrastructure slide, Jenkins is, an, again, a continuous integration server which runs on a non-development environment. So whenever a uh, code is pushed onto the branch, uh, the continuous integration test runs. So, and it's very handy because it gives you uh, results and it gives you fast, faster feedback, whether you have broke the build or you can revert those changes if, uh, uh, if you have broke the build. And uh, th there's no, no more uh, wait time for the developers to wait for the testing team to take those code changes and run the test. So what are the prerequisites to run for the CSIT? You need a Python version of 2.7. You need Robo, Robo framework of 3.0. You need Robo framework request and uh, version 0.45 and request 2. Dot and uh, Python state. You need, an you need to clone uh, latest integration, uh, latest integration or test master, and you need to clone the latest drilling or builder master. You need to have a Jenkins job builder version, and you have, need to have a virtual new wrapper version 4.7.1. So, and we are, we are using OS 2.3.2. So, these versions may change in due course of time. So, these are the versions we are using present, uh, presently to run our CSIT environment. So, next is the prerequisite. So, what is the VM snapshot you are using? So, we are using a VM snapshot OS of Ubuntu 14. And we are using 10 virtual CPU to run the VM. And we have an, using a 16 GB of RAM and ODL heap sizes, 8 GB, and we are using in a cluster environment. So either you can use as a standalone or as a uh, cluster environment, but whatever CSIT we are running, we are running on a three-node cluster uh, with this configuration. This is not a standard configuration. So uh, basically, we use this configuration for our functional testing as well as scale-up and performance testing. So you can uh, use for, uh, and lower numbers too for your uh, testing. So with this, I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Sanjeev, who will take you over to the uh, topology, how to deploy and cluster, and he'll uh, tell you about the CSIT environment. Thank you. Thanks, Sumesh. OK. As I said, right, uh, we have taken a very, you know, uh, very simple approach and a very simple topology. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, three-node cluster topology. And uh, we will use, basically, throughout this session, we will use this topology and to explain uh, the test cases. So, uh, sorry. so as you see, uh, you know, this is the three-node controller, so three VMs are basically running, and um, it's the northbound REST API, and in the southbound, we have Mininet. Uh, within that, uh, you can you know, spawn many uh, uh, switches. So in this, uh, so I will explain uh, you know, how you, if you download a distribution, how you can install it very easily. Um, okay, so, so basically, um, you know, uh, for a three-node cluster, uh, once you download it, so you download, this is the distribution, actually. The distribution car of something, uh, 0.x.x snapshot. So you unzip it, basically. And if you unzip it and go to the bin directory in any of the VM, then you will see all these files are there, actually. Cluster.sh and uh, the, the scripts are there. So uh, this configure underscore cluster dot sh basically if you run this then it will and if you give appropriate uh, you know uh, you know arguments for that then it will basically create a cluster uh, you know uh, the configuration that is required for a cl cluster it will create those things 
So what it basically creates, uh, you know, uh, basically your, uh, for, for a cluster, you need, uh, you know, akka.conf and the modulesarts.conf uh, and uh, modules.conf, those files, uh, those are being populated actually if you run these scripts. So, so um, you take these individual distributions, put it in three nodes, uh, three individual nodes, and then execute it one by one. So this is the argument that you have to give. So if it is a cluster node one, so give as the index value as one, and give the whole set of IP actually. So this is dot fifty one, dot fifty two, and say dot fifty three. Similarly, do the exercise in uh, node two, but here the index value is two. That is important, and then give the same set of IP addresses. And in the same thing, you execute it in node three. So once you execute all those three things. So your, the basic configuration or cluster configuration that is required to run a cluster is being set. So now uh, you have to install the features. So to install the features, basically you can do it two way. Either you can manually do it or you can do it by, by the feature boot. So to install uh, manually, like you, know, uh, you have to manually configure one by one all the uh, you know, features. And if you want to do, do not want to do it manually, so another, uh, the easiest way is put it in, in etc actually, you will find this org.apache.caraf features.cfg, put your feature boots inside that uh, for this parameter um, and then restart it. So when it comes up, uh, you know, it will take the, all the features and it will install. So once, uh, you know, you do the, you know, restart, then you will find that uh, and you wait for some time for all the ports to come up and the clustering to happen. So then you verify uh, whether these ports are up actually. This 2550, this is the clustering port and this is the southbound OpenFlow plugin port. So you wait for that. For a three node cluster, basically each node will have an ingress and egress communication to the peer node. So for that reason, you will have actually four one, because if you see, right, so if it is 51, so 51 will have a connection with 52 in ingress connection, and then again a to 53, and there is a egress connection to 53 to 51, and uh, uh, 52 to 51. So in that way, for each node, you will find that, uh, you know, this kind of, this four port establishment port information should come up, then you know, okay, the clustering has formed. And uh, before starting anything, you also should check whether your OpenFlow plugin port, this 63, uh, 6633 port has come or not. So once this is done, then you know that, okay, your installation has been at least basic clustering installation has been successful, and then you can move on uh, and you can run your automation test against that. Okay, now uh, my colleague uh, Sinduri will, uh, you know, uh, explain you some, uh, you know, uh, steps, uh, how you can clone and how you can get started with, uh, you know, the uh, integration test. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Now I'm going to give an overview on uh, integration test suits which are running in our CSIT in ODL. So uh, how, how we will clone the integration test repo is uh, if you are planning to commit your uh, test scripts to the CSIT, you can, uh, you can create a username uh, with your email ID in uh, Open Daylight. And with the same credentials, you can log into your uh, Git and access the integration uh, project. Uh, integration project uh, for test uh, integration test project in uh, Git in Open Daylight. So you will get the URL from GitHub in Open Daylight. So you can use Git, Git clone and the URL to download the test repository to your uh, local setup. Or as mentioned, you can take the VM, ODL VM, uh, which they're distributing, and then you can copy into the same location. So once you clone the repository, uh, what you, you create a uh, directory named integration and clone into that repository. So once you clone it, you will find a uh, directory created called test, as you can see. Um, so inside the test, the directories are st structured this way. Uh, you will have CSIT 
and tools. So tools is the location where you will have uh, scripts uh, which are meant for performance tests and any shell scripts and uh, Python scripts. You can have it in tools location. These are usually uh, used to uh, test performance aspects of controller. Like you can, uh, some example uh, already tools which are available in Open Daylight uh, integration test repo or flow config blaster and uh, cbench test which will give the which will uh, have the performance test and uh, graphs also plotted for the same so coming into the uh, csit directory so we'll have this set of folders config plans library script plans scripts source test plans variables so i'll be explaining uh, what these directories are meant for and uh, how do we place if we are intending to write our own uh, uh, test suite for any of our projects so how we will place our uh, test script and uh, so first we'll uh, talk about libraries so libraries are the place uh, is a location where we'll keep our common uh, common you commonly used keywords for our project or if it is meant for all the projects to be used we'll place it will place it in the libraries so these are the example libraries uh, which we have in csit uh, we have uh, utils dot robo which will usually have uh, start mininet login uh, and uh, execute some commands a kind of common type of keywords then uh, we have karaf keywords where if you want to uh, install feature within the karaf prompt and uninstall and uh, check the logs from the karaf prompt you can have certain set of key you all you are already having certain se set of keywords in karaf keywords dot robo file uh, similarly, cluster OVSDB dot robo will contain uh, keywords to start a, uh, to add a bridge, delete a bridge in a clustered environment. Uh, we have Mininet Karaf, uh, Mi Mininet keywords dot robo as well, which will have uh, uh, certain specific Mininet specific uh, keywords like uh, stop the Mininet, start the Mininet, and execute uh, commands to Mininet prompt. So now coming to uh, suits. So uh, this is where we will place our uh, te test suits. Test uh, test suits. So if uh, first we need to identify which which component of ODL we are planning to we are contributing our test to. So we can place L ex we example like if we are contributing our test to OpenFlow plugin uh, project. So we can place. Sorry. We can place our test groups, uh, test suits within OpenFlow plugin uh, directory within the suits. So either if it's a common aspect uh, to OpenFlow plugin, you can place, or you can create a directory of your own and place all your test suits. So for example, uh, here we have OpenFlow, uh, OpenFlow uh, open within OpenFlow plugin. We are writing some. We have contributed some clustering tests. So we have created. Uh, uh, set, uh, we have created a subfolder and uh, uh, written our test cases within the folder. Uh, then, the, then coming to then coming to test plans. So we have all. Let's say we have created certain uh, uh, test suits, like uh, set, uh, three, four uh, test suits for our project. Now we want to decide in which uh, sequence they need to run and what test cases we want to run in the CSIT for our project so that will be decided by using uh, by specifying in uh, test plan so you can create a file uh, this has uh, some naming convention which you can find in uh, uh, csit coding guidelines so uh, you need to uh, and also you need to mention uh, at free, at what frequency you need to run the you need to run, you need these test cases to be run for your project let's say clustering daily will ha will have your uh, test cases executed uh, daily 
So, uh, and next, uh, like, and this this folder, this test uh, test test plan folder will be picked up uh, by the JJP uh, file you will mention for your project, uh, and the, in the same sequence, Jenkins will run your job. So we have something called uh, config plans and script plans uh, and scripts. So if you need some scripts uh, to be run before or before the installation of controller or before uh, the controller boots, you can place those scripts in the scripts location. And uh, same thing you can invoke through config plans and uh, script plans. You have to similarly like how we have a, a text file in the test suits, test plans. Similarly, you can have in config plans and script plans. Uh, for what uh, means in what sequence you need to execute those scripts. So, but there is a slight difference between script plans and config plans. That is, uh, script plans you will invoke uh, before even installation of the controller. Config plans you will invoke after uh, before the boot of the controller. So, these are some of the example uh, test suits uh, in the clustering uh, project. So, in OpenFlow we have a directory created called clustering underscore bulkomatic and under which we are uh, testing uh, cluster we are testing ODL cluster for bulk flows and uh, multi reconciliation for multi DPN here here we are, uh, in this in this test source we are pushing bulk flows uh, to the ODL cluster and verifying the data replication and across the cluster nodes, and when the DPNs disconnects and connects back, whether reconciliation happens across all the nodes. So similarly, likewise, we have uh, clustering, uh, which will, uh, we have test suits in clustering. Uh, it, will, uh, it will just uh, test the HA aspect, where uh, determining uh, the entity owners and uh, in case of HA failover, uh, whether the data replication is intact and all the nodes are served appropriately. So, coming to uh, see, going back to the before slide, we have uh, under the CSIT we have something uh, called variables and uh, variables. So under variables, you will have the common set of variables used for uh, all the projects, like uh, controller IP, uh, Mininet IP, and any REST conf URLs, which standard URLs, which you'll use for uh, commonly across for all the projects. And if you want specific variables in your project, under the variables for a directory, you can have a, a directory created for your own project and define any uh, input files, JSON, XMLs, and uh, uh, create variables of your own. So now, uh, and once we create, uh, let's say, uh, once we create our test suit, and how do we run it? So this is a command. Pybot is a command, which you, it's a CLI, uh, we, uh, through which you can invoke uh, the execution of uh, a robo uh, test suit. So, hyphen v and you can specify the arguments using hyphen v option and uh, uh, you can set the log level using hyphen l so these are the these are the defined uh, variables in variables.py file you uh, whenever we give values to the variables through command line uh, whatever default options we, has, we have set in variables.py will be uh, overridden by these values So these are the standard libraries uh, which are used in, uh, which are there, which Robo framework provides to us, like built-in, uh, Telnet, SSH, String, um, operating system process, etc. So using a built-in process, SSH library are the uh, ones which we commonly use, uh, from uh, which are the commonly used uh, libraries provided by Robo framework. So we use like a build for built in process you can use uh, you keywords like set suit variable uh, and uh, a log and from process library you can uh, use start process stop process 
uh, and send signal to process are the uh, common keywords which we can get from these libraries. And uh, SSH is the most common thing we'll use because we have to SSH to our uh, SSH to other switches, mini net nodes, and controller nodes, and we would need to perform certain operations. So you will find all the uh, key, uh, basic keywords which we can use by importing these libraries into your uh, test suite. So there are apart from libraries, there are built-in tools like tidy, uh, ti tidy, rebot, and uh, Okay, uh, these, uh, these tools you can use in your log, ge log file generation and further processing of the log file generation and uh, clean up of uh, certain folders uh, while using Robo Framework. Coming to basics of writing a test suite, so this is what the test suite in a Robo Framework will look like. So you have uh, settings uh, in which uh, documentation, so you can uh, describe what is your uh, test suite uh, means w what tests you are going to write in your test suite and uh, which projects and what part of what function what part of functionality it is testing so you can describe in the documentation and suite setup suit teardown or settings uh, which which are in turn or keywords so if let's say for a test suite you want certain setup to be created before the start of the test so the same uh, you can call those keywords uh, in the suit setup or if you have a certain set of keywords, you can have an init file uh, for if it is a common for all the for the entire entire your project rather than just for the test suite itself. You can have an init file in the same in the same project folder which you have. Or if it is only specific to the test suite, you can have it in uh, suite setup. And once uh, all the tests in your test suite are finished, uh, your test teardown uh, where Let's say, for example, here you are creating a controller session at the start of your test setup, which will be used uh, throughout your te test suite. Once the test cases are executed, you can delete the session. So uh, the next one is the resource. So resource is uh, in this setting you can uh, you can import any user defined keyword files which you have written as for your project or if it's a common thing uh, you you can import the same and uh, you have variables if for importing the common variables or your project specific variables you can use variable setting so uh, then we have local variables you can instead of if you don't if your variable scope is within your test suite you can uh, create variables like list if it's a list or scalar whatever the type of the variable is you can create locally in the test suite itself it can also be an input file so here we are importing uh, we are importing a json uh, uh, format input variable file so next there is one more thing, uh, like uh, one more setting called library, which you will use for uh, importing uh, uh, Robo Framework, uh, uh, Robo Framework libraries like SSH library and all. So in test cases, you will uh, you will call keywords. So this is a test case. And uh, inside it, you you are calling a keyword from uh, the file uh, from the resource file, which is uh, from the imported resource file here, cluster keywords dot robo. From the uh, inside it, there are some keywords created, like create controller index list. So you are calling the specific create controller li index list keyword from the cluster keywords dot file. And uh, this set suit variable is also a keyword. This is a, a keyword from the built-in library, and you are making it uh, available to uh, this variable available to the entire suite. So similarly, you can have uh, your uh, means based on what test you want to write. You can use the uh, keywords from the common uh, from the library CSIT libraries or the uh, robot framework uh, built-in and other libraries. So the next git commit procedure and uh, uh, about how to run your tests in sandbox uh, my colleague sanjeev will continue with the rest of the presentation thank you
Thanks, Indri. So, uh, so far, uh, you know, we have learned in this session that uh, what are the basic, uh, you know, ecosystem of a, you know, CSIT environment and uh, what are the, uh, like, Git, Carrot, and uh, Jenkins. Um, and then we know about how your um, robot framework, all the important libraries of robot framework, then in CSIT, what are, what are the important uh, you know, variables those are used, and how you can run it. So everything we have learned. Now you have, by understanding everything, you can create your own test suit. We also saw in last slide um, you know, how a basic you know, test suit can be formulated. So after that, once your test suit is done, then the next step is that you need to commit it to, to the uh, community. So for that, actually, uh, uh, you need some, you know, have some understanding of git commands and uh, I, uh, you know some steps are basically enumerated here actually uh, the first thing is that uh, sign into a git uh, code review generate and add ssh key so in your setup so that you know whatever uh, uh, this is a you know uh, this ssh key setting is required so you have to do it in your laptop if you are doing it uh, in your laptop or through a server then you have to do the uh, whatever the key uh, generated in your uh, server that you have to put it there um, um, in the git uh, review page so that um, you, know, you will be able to push your uh, code there. And uh, the first thing, as we have already discussed, that you have to do the git cloning and then go to the test directory. Um, then you add your files there. Uh, sorry, you will add the files later on, but you can use these commands like git config, your username, then this email and this uh, till this SAP Git hooks, you have to you know um, uh, you have to execute these commands. Then copy the new file changes to re respective directories and execute Git status. So Git status basically you can execute at any point of time uh, to see whether uh, you know the uh, the status of Git status. And uh, then uh, you have to use this Git add uh, for adding the new files. And if it is and for the first time you are doing, so uh, for a, a new commit, you have to use minus a minus s, and then if it is a amend, then you have to use minus uh, amend option. And then, you, as I said, you can see the git status, uh, and then you can push the, uh, with using git push command, you can push it to the master. So here, basically, we have all in, uh, the scripts are, you know, everything is in master. There is no branch as such. Uh, everything is pushed into the master. So you can refer uh, some important uh, wiki uh, links that is given there. So this, as I said, right, this is a git, uh, git status uh, command. Uh, if you run, uh, so this is a simple uh, run. So whatever, what is the uh, thing, right, in a few things modified, few things deleted. So all these things it displays, it gives you an idea, okay, you have added these things. These are the things that are deleted. So you get an idea on that. Then git add command. So what are the files that, uh, suppose you have uh, uh, added something in one location, some other thing in other location. So all those things uh, you have to do, you, you are giving the path. Suppose uh, we are putting some input files. So git add and then that input file path we have given. And then suppose uh, we are putting some libraries. So git add and go to the library path we have given and put the this file, uh, bulkomatic keywords.robot. And uh, similarly, if you, you, we are putting some uh, CSET uh, uh, test suits, so then we are giving the path for the uh, test suits also. So you have to, whatever, whatever the files that you want to add, you have to add it via git add command. Then git commit, uh, as I said, um, you, know, uh, you have to, whether it is a new or it is an amend, um, you have to use the git commit. And, um, so this is an example of git commit uh, amend. And once it is successfully executed, actually it will open up a you know, git log uh, you know, window where you have to put uh, you know, uh, your um, the commit message, proper commit message you have to put. And uh, typically we have to put, you know, give a due diligence. Typically we use you know, very short or a you know um, uh, you know string kind of thing, but you should not do that. We have a proper uh, link I have provided uh, in uh, next slides in coding guidelines. 
So we have to give enough information so that the reviewer can understand okay, what are the things or what are the th uh, you know, test suits that you are pushing in, what are the changes you have done, what are the new libraries you have put. All those things you have to give it in a proper format and the link is given in coding guideline page. So, so you have to give it uh, uh, in the uh, proper commit message. Then git push uh, and uh, if uh, git push and uh, this the whole st uh, string you have to give and if it's successful um, uh, else it, it will give error. If it is not successful it will give error here. If it is successful it will, uh, this is an example if a successful git push is uh, run. Then git cherry pick. Uh, so this will be used like suppose you have developed something, you have pushed it and you have got some review comments. So, and uh, you want to act upon some review comments. So for that you have to use the git cherry pick. Uh, using this git cherry pick, um, you can, uh, whatever the, the original files that you were working on, you can uh, bring up on that and then you can uh, amend on top of that and after that you can push it. Okay, so integration test coding and uh, Garrett submission guidelines. So uh, there are a lot of, actually if you go to this page, coding guideline page, it is a uh, lot of things are given in uh, coding guidelines. But I will touch upon few things that uh, you know uh, I have come across uh, during my test and uh, the review process I have gone through. So typically, um, you know, um, in any test suit that you write, right, you have to have, uh, you know, some sessions uh, you will use, uh, you know, you need to log into different uh, cluster nodes, you need to perform certain activity. So for that actually the easiest way is, uh, you know, you use the, um, you know, IP address directly and then uh, uh, use SSH command. But that is not the way we should be using it. So we have uh, in our, uh, if we go to our previous slides, okay, so some important things are written here actually setup, suit setup and suit teardown. So if this controller, create controller sessions and delete all sessions. So this, this is very important actually when you are um, you know, using any test suit and you want to have a um, handle on something by which you can uh, connect to the controller, you can execute certain commands and uh, fetch the result. So you need not to have a you know, create another session, uh, individual session for that. You have to use the instances uh, that has been created by the uh, create controller sessions. So that's what uh, uh, it is said in the uh, you know coding guideline that you should not use um, you know for REST sessions or any SSS sessions. You sh should use the sessions that has already been instantiated, and uh, you should not uh, start any new one. And then uh, also you should use the um, uh, should tear down to delete um, you know all sessions during startup. You have to use that. Then repeated work, suppose some keywords that you are uh, you know, doing it repeatedly, so it is better that you put it inside the libraries so that uh, everybody can use and you also can use and the code will be efficient. And uh, also uh, tr try to, I have not mentioned it here, but uh, if you are uh, uh, using slip inside, so don't use slip inside that, uh, try if you could uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of wait for a loop and, uh, and try to uh, expect that uh, this particular string that you were expecting rather than putting an indiscriminate slip. So try not to use slip. Then uh, if you are uh, basically, uh, if you are using write tool for your script and other thing, you need not to worry for this uh, step. But if you are uh, doing manually in command line option, so in that case, before submitting, use the uh, TD tool basically because if you do that, typically we uh, you know have some spaces or some indentation issues. So those things will be taken care if you use that before uh, doing the submission. And then, as I uh, said, actually use proper commit messages. And uh, if you want, check out this link. It will give uh, how a proper commit message is written. And um, for other comprehensive you know integration test coding guidelines, you can uh, use this link. Okay, now uh, you know coming to uh, very important thing. Now we have discussed from uh, starting right. You know what is uh, you know how you can write a test suit and uh, all the libraries and everything. 
and how you can submit it uh, using git commands. But after that, once it goes to the submission phase, then the reviewer can ask for a sandbox run. So you need to run it in a sandbox environment, and then after that, uh, you know, a reviewer can review it, view, review the logs, and then uh, give the comments. So for that, actually, um, the sa creating sandbox environment and understanding it, how you can create it, is very important. So the first thing is that to create a sandbox environment, uh, the way you have cloned your, uh, you know, integration test. Similarly, you have to clone your uh, this Relang Builder, uh, Relang Builder repo. You have to clone it to your uh, to your local environment. So, uh, we, before going further, basically we need to know actually what is this Relang Builder. We understand what is uh, our uh, integration uh, test. We understand, but uh, what is this Relang Builder? So, uh, Relang is basically it's an abbreviation uh, it's rel is for release and uh, eng for engineer uh, so release engineering uh, and what it does basically relang builder basically it does three things um, it uh, it host all the uh, you know scripts that we are writing it host all the scripts then um, uh, it create Creates the VM uh, that uh, you know in the, say in a three-node cluster or a single node um, uh, node uh, standalone node you are using. So it creates uh, creates the VM and manages the VM, and then it cre uh, it uh, puts the you know build that are going to be run in uh, Jenkins. That also Relang Builder takes care and manages the build pipeline. So these are the three important things the Relang uh, Builder does. So uh, so what is a sandbox? Now you know what is the functionality of a three main functionality of Relang Builder. The sandbox configuration is nothing but a, a mirror of the master Relang Builder silo. So what is the master Relang Builder silo? This is the the sandbox is the you know a mirror copy of that. So in the, so we we are running basically in the sandbox means it is almost like running it in the Relang Builder environment. So the uh, so you have to clone it by uh, git clone and then existing Relang Builder repo is there. If you, if it is already existing, you can do a rebase. Um, and then after that, the important thing you go inside that and then you will find one uh, file called Jenkins.ini. So in the Jenkins.ini, I have highlighted you have to give the username and you have to give the password also. So this password uh, basically, uh, you know, um, you have to. Uh, I have given in the next slide. There is a help text email uh, ID is there. So you have to request for them for this password to be generated. Uh, and once this is done, uh, so you have to put in your af after cloning it. You have to fill uh, appropriately as the username, password, and this uh, plugin info equal to false. You have to give it in your local uh, Relang Builder. Uh, um, uh, directory you have to fill in the Jenkins.ini, and uh, uh, this is basically uh, if you want to know more about uh, you know the uh, Jenkins sandbox environment uh, in a step-by-step -step mode, so you can use this uh, link. Then very important thing, create a YAML file. So what basically uh, you know uh, we are doing it here. That uh, or the uh, how we are creating the uh, sandbox. Basically, we are first cloning the Relang Builder uh, to our local environment, and in that uh, we are giving the input for the Jenkins.ini file, and then we are creating a YAML file where we will give the way we want our test to be run. Suppose we want to run it in a uh, three-node cluster or a single standalone machine. We want to use a particular stream. We want to run whether in a daily way or you want to run some hourly uh, basis. So all those things, or what are the triggers for that? So all those things, you can mention it in that YAML file. So the YAML file, will alt uh, we will execute that YAML file, and we will uh, you know, get a uh, process that YAML file. It will uh, give a XML output uh, instruction sets. And that XML output instruction set, if we push it to the um, uh, 
to the um, uh, Relang master, then it will create a sandbox environment there, sandbox instance there. So the important things here are uh, the basically uh, what is the job name you want to give actually. So this the first thing is the project. What is the project name? You can give any name here. There is no restriction for that. But the job name you have, as I said, right? If it is a CC3 node, right? So you have to give it as a CC3 node. That is the important thing. And then you have to give what is the functionality. So you can give the functionality name here. What is the project name here? Whether what is the stream here? Suppose we I want to run in Boron, right? So you have to mention it in Boron, and then. Um, uh, then you have to, what are the uh, you know, features you want to install in that, uh, in that sandbox, so you have to give it here. Then supports some in robot, uh, the variables, right? You want to pass something specific, you have to give here. And some trigger jobs, if you want to give, uh, you can give it here. Suppose you want to add some additional VMs, that also, that option is not there, but you can edit in the YAML file. So that will help you uh, along with three node. Basically, when we say three node, along with that, uh, the Mininet instance, one single Mininet instance comes. But if you want more, then you can give it here also in that. So then you have to create a uh, creating JJB test. Basically, you have created a YAML file. Now you need to test that YAML file. Um, uh, so that before sending it to the, uh, you know, before upstreaming it, uh, so that it will create a sandbox instance, you need to create, uh, you need to test it basically. So for that, you have to do s certain steps. So as I have said, right, uh, previously uh, in these software dependencies, we have uh, mentioned that, you know, a virtual RAN wrap, LAN wrapper is required. So you have to, basically we are creating a logical environment in our local setup and you are testing it. And then if the test result say, says is perfect, then we'll push it for creating a sandbox instance. So for that, we are executing the virtual RAN wrapper dot sh. You have to execute that and then uh, make virtual LAN GJB, JJB. Uh, JJB is nothing but Jenkins job builder and then work on JJB and then use this command basically. And here the important part is this, this we are saying it is test, it is not update. So it will test it in your local environment whether whatever the YAML input you have given that is proper or not. And then you have to expand what is the, um, in that we, in the YAML we have given this job name, right? So we have to expand it there. This job name we have to expand. Expand in the sense we have given it in the project, right? We have to put the project, then functionality, then install, then all this trim that we have to expand it so that it will come like this. And then you execute that. So if it is a successful execution, then it will give that uh, builder number of jobs generated as one info. So that gives means the, you know, JJB has been created. It is, uh, you know, you can push it for creating a sandbox instance. So after that, just use the same command, only change it here as update, this one, as update. So, and if that update is successful, it will give a message like this, number of jobs generated one. The successful, and this YAML file, suppose it, uh, once everything is done, your code has been submitted, so that YAML file also needs to be submitted in the Relang Builder because that will give you that how things will run because you have given all this at the way it runs, the three node cluster, this stream, this build, this is the trigger points, all those things will be generated. So then we will go, uh, basically, so in the previous slide, we saw that uh, you know uh, our sandbox instance is created, so now you, you need to go inside the sandbox instance and log in and see uh, you know, how you can run it. So this is the link for sandbox. If you just use that link and uh, put your credentials, um, you will go inside that. So if this is a sample uh, example given here, so you can see, uh, then you can see a lot of uh, you know, sandbox instances are running. So if your sandbox update is successful, you will find the way I have 
highlighted here, you will find the jo your job name here. You double click on your job, and then if it is running, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you start, uh, it starts running, uh, you know, then the build informations are given here actually. Build one, two, three, like that, the build will be there. And if it is successful, the color will be uh, blue. If it is uh, unsuccessful, then it will be red. So, and uh, suppose here, sorry. Here, say, two test cases are there. I have given an example. So it will give you whether it is run, the success rate, it is pass or fail, everything it will give here. And then you can play around here. A lot of things you could do, actually. Suppose you are experimenting, right? So your test case is not passing. You want to experiment with the variables, different arguments that you want to pass. You want to experiment with that. So you, can, you want to rebuild it. So you can do a lot of things here, actually. So I have, uh, you know, for the slides mentioned, oh, what all things you can do, actually, in the sandbox. OK, so one of the, uh, this thing is configure. Uh, so here you will see one something called configure. Here, this one. So basically, uh, uh, suppose uh, uh, in your sandbox, right, so I'll give you an example. Suppose you are running uh, a slightly scale of test, and your uh, requirement is, uh, say for uh, yeah, example, it is say 8 vCPU and uh, you know, say 8 GB RAM is your requirement. But by default, uh, it takes uh, you know, 2 vCPU and uh, 2 GB RAM. Uh, by default, the sandbox uh, configuration typically takes. So if you want to change it, if you want to change that thing, so you have to go to this configure, and then you go, uh, all the you know, options are there where your VM, you can set what is the kind of VM you want to run. You can do that. Suppose the log rotation and log strategy you want to use, you can uh, you know, use in that. You can change that uh, so that you know, the log, uh, log rotation and uh, when to uh, log, uh, log, what is the maximum size of logs that you can mention. If you want to um, you know, change something, some other parameters, you can change it in the configure and save it so that further subsequent runs will take this configuration. Then, uh, so build with parameters. Suppose you want to play around with the parameter dynamically, so you just um, go to this build with parameter option, and then you can give a lot of, uh, you know, play around with the parameters, uh, you know, online, pa you know, sorry, uh, the uh, command line parameters. But the important thing here is that uh, the Garrett review that you have done for your script, so that reference ID you have to give, you have to give it here, so that it will run, that script will run by uh, this reference ID. That is the important thing in that slide. So, and then going to next slide. So rebuild with last uh, parameter. So if you want to rebuild with the last parameter, then you have to give, and also here important thing is that the proper test plan and patch, uh, patch ref spec that I have already told. So you have to see that, you know, the test plan as Sinduri told, right, if you are using multiple test suits are there and you want to have a sequence uh, in any order, so for that the test plan is required. So you have to give, you have to ensure that test plan also a reference is given and the patch ref reference, Garrett reference is there. Then uh, the inside build, suppose, uh, you know, uh, you want to know actually runtime what has happened actually inside. So you can go to have a console access also. So you can go inside the build. As you can see right in previous slide, these are the build information. This, the, all the run will is given here actually. Suppose you have run 10 times, right? So you have, these icons are there, 10 icons will display here. So you can go inside and see what has done, happened actually inside the sandbox. So, so go inside, click say build number two, I clicked on build number two, I will get this GUI and then it will give the browse, browse results and then uh, open the report, then open the log file, then here the console output is there. If I log into the console output, then I can see actually um, if you have given any uh, say log messages are there which will print to the console, then you can see it actually here. So it's for debugging time, it, it is a great help. And then, um, you know, browse test result. In that build, if you want to browse the test result, I've, give, I've taken an example where something passed and something failed, actually. So you want to know which one passed and which one failed. So you will get it here, actually. 
so these are the failed test cases and these that test suit these are the test suit and these are the failed test cases so you get an you log into that in tree structure uh, you will find the exact location where uh, the uh, the test cases failed so with that um, i'm coming to the conclusion so continuous system integration is the order of the day because as an uh, as we are moving for a you know uh, open source technology where a continuous uh, integration is the order of the day uh, uh, we need to you know uh, educate ourselves in all these areas um, like git jenkins garrett um, it is not a domain of only a developer a tester also has to know it so that uh, effectively you know we can leverage actually what all the facilities it gives so as i said uh, you know we have to get familiar with git garrett jenkins uh, it helps immensely to get close with the odl ways of working and uh, on top of that uh, the sandbox environment is also very important uh, because uh, you might have written something but unless until you prove it and run it uh, with the sandbox environment um, it is of no use basically so you have to basically validate it in sandbox environment then only be it will be easily accepted in the community and uh, with that oh, we are at question and answer session uh, so if any questions uh, please feel to ask okay uh, if there is no question then uh, thanks a lot for a you know after lunch patient uh, hearing of the session uh, thank you very much